Let's say you bring in your own object and make it a nanite mesh and you see these weird little artifacts with the shadows. The way to fix this is to go to project settings, go to ray trace shadows, and you'll actually find out that ray trace shadows, if you were to turn it off, is what's causing these issues. But sometimes you might want to have ray trace shadows because they're so much more realistic compared to the virtual shadow maps that Unreal comes with at default. To be able to have that and fix the issue, make sure to type in r.raytracing.nanite.mode space one and press enter. And as you can see right here, this just completely disappears. If we were to move around these lights, we're getting perfect soft shadows coming from our ray trace shadows while having this issue fixed. If you were to play back your animation inside of your viewport, you'll start to see some weird ghosting effects happening, especially with your animations. Like for example, in this chameleon, it has a lot of details and as it's moving around, you can see that there's some weird temporal effects happening right there. Right, well, how do we solve this? Well, the easy way to do this is to go to settings, project settings, and then go ahead and type in anti-aliasing. As you can see, we have temporal super resolution as our anti-aliasing method. None of these are exactly the perfect method to choose. It really depends on what your project is. But for this project, I actually ended up using fast anti-aliasing. And this tends to work because we're having a lot of fast moving motion. And while we're getting some artifacting happening in the specular highlights with those sparkles right there, it doesn't affect the motion. And it's actually nice and clear, which is much more helpful for my project than TSR. But results can change depending on which one you choose. Let's say you have all these gizmos right here and they're really distracting you and cluttering up your viewport. How do you disable them? Press the G key. And once you press them, you'll see that they're all disappeared. Press the G key again and you'll find out that you'll get these back. Now usually a big mistake that a lot of people do is that they forget to actually change their settings inside of their engine scalability. So usually it's set to high, but I recommend that people set it to cinematic, which is ideally gonna force all the highest quality settings onto your scene for deferred rendering. The other thing that I would also do is I'd actually go ahead and make sure that you go into your settings and make sure that you set your material scalability to epic because it's normally set to high almost every time you choose your viewport. So just make sure to do that. One of the most important things you absolutely need to have in your scene is a post-process volume. So we can actually get a post-process volume right here from the place actors menu you can go ahead and place this right here. Next thing we want to do once you get it is you want to go ahead and type in infinite. And once you do that, you want to make sure that this checkbox is turned on so that this actually affects your entire scene instead of just being inside the box. We can actually see that we're getting a completely different look of the film whenever we turn it off versus turning it back on. You can actually change a lot of the ways that you have your effects. So you can actually change the style of your balloon. You can change and add depth of field. You can add a general effects like this lens flare right here. But also on top of that, the most important thing that you can actually do with the post-process volume is you can actually go ahead and change your render settings pretty much directly inside of this one object. So right here we have our global illumination. We can actually change the lighting quality and change all the render settings right here very quickly and within just one node. And the good thing about the post-process volume is that it'll automatically update it within your render settings without having to go back and forth. Usually when you start off Unreal, you see that the exposure actually changes based on where you're looking at. But we actually want to make sure that we have constant exposure. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're setting your exposure via auto exposure mode, but then setting the min and max EV to be the exact same amount. This will be helpful so that whenever you're looking around in your scene, your exposure is not changing. Let's say that we have our object right here that we brought in, but our pivot point is somewhere way over there. How do we make sure that we bring this pivot point all the way to near the center of the object? Well, the way that we can do that is we can alt middle mouse drag onto any of the arrows right there. And you can see that it's actually moving the pivot point exactly where we want it to be. The other methodology to actually moving the pivot point is to left click onto wherever you want it to be, go over to pivot, and then go over to set pivot offset here. And it automatically comes over to where you want it to be. Next up, what we want to do is we want to go ahead and left click and then go into pivot and then make sure that you set as pivot offset so that it's now locked to that exact position. So if you were to drag the pivot, it would actually perfectly drag in the spot that you want it to. Let's say that you opened up a new project, but let's say that you forgot to actually load in the starter content in the beginning of creating this level. Where do we find it? 
Well, you can actually go over to add feature or content pack and you can actually get any sort of starter content or any of these template blueprints all the way after you've done all of your changes. So you can actually go ahead and add that to your project. And as you can see, it's bringing in all of your assets right here into your content drawer. Let's say you have an object inside of Maya or Blender where it's all inside of a group or a collection. First export your object as normal and make sure that you go into the advanced tab inside of mesh and search for combine meshes and make sure that you check that on and once you import it and you bring that object into your scene you'll actually find out that it's going to be exactly one mesh and it's going to be all grouped together with the correct pivot point. Let's say you want to migrate this animatic right here to another project. How would you do so? Well, you just have to left click, go into asset actions, and then go into migrate. And actually, you can see right here that it brings in all the assets associated with this animatic. So all the assets, all the materials, all the textures. And then what you have to do is go over to the project that you want to send all this content to. So for me, I want to go ahead and send this over here to the VDevRick file. So I can just go ahead and select that right there. And then next, you want to go into the content folder. This is super important. Make sure that you're in the content folder of your actual place that you want to send this to. Then once you select this folder, Unreal will detect it and send all the assets. Let's say we have ourselves an object right here and we see that we have all these things as separate objects, but we want to move all of them at the same time. A big mistake people do is they make a group actor and then they're controlling it. But the big problem with group actors is that you're actually not able to individually modify each of those parts as well as you need to. Well, what if you need to be able to do that? What I recommend is that you actually ungroup everything and not use groups because groups are generally kind of broken inside of Unreal. What I'd recommend is that you actually go ahead and take an actor that you bring it in from the place actors menu. Go ahead and put that somewhere near your character and then go ahead and rename that to whatever your group name should be. Select all of the pieces of the group. And as you can see right here, you have to make sure that the mobility of your actor is set to movable right there. Select all of your pieces again, and then make sure you put it inside of the actor. So now you can see that if we were to move this actor, the entire object is moving along with it as its parent. But also you can edit different parts of it and move all the other pieces without having any problems that would break your group. This is honestly the best method of using groups and I highly recommend everyone use this tip. Sometimes there's bugs with Mixamo or any other animations that you bring into Unreal Engine where sometimes it would not import properly. The easiest fix that I can recommend is you go ahead and select your object, open up and import your object. You'll actually see that there is an, a section that says animation length. Instead of setting it to export a time, I'd set it to animate a time. Once you import the object, you'll actually see that you're getting your animation perfectly there. Let's go ahead and bring this into our sequencer. And once we were to take this, put it in right there, and then we can actually see that we have ourselves a goofy little sequence that we can play out. Let's say you have yourself some sort of leaf or wall right here. And let's say that you're trying to find out why parts of it is kind of disappearing as it's being occluded. Well, this is because your mesh is actually not double-sided. And the way to fix this is actually really easy. Go over to the material that's actually applied to your object right there. So let's go ahead and click on the shader, which you can just go ahead and double click. And then once you do that, you can scroll down and search for two-sided. Check that on and make sure to apply and save your material. Once you do this, you'll actually see that you're getting the backside and back faces properly rendering instead of Unreal. So let's say we have ourselves this leaf right here, which we only need the green parts and not really the white parts. So we want to be able to make an alpha mask out of this texture. But what we can do is we can actually go ahead and create and use the blue channel as my mask for the alpha. So what I can do is I can go ahead and go to the blend mode, change it from opaque to masked. And once you do that, select your B value, put it into the one minus so they can get an inverted version and put it onto the opacity mask, which just got exposed. And as we can see right here, we have ourselves a perfectly nice leaf that's both double-sided and is a masked material. You can go ahead and apply it to your heart's content. As you can see right here, we're getting a lot of really nice leaves. To properly build skylighting, we want to make sure that we actually start off with something empty, go over to your environment light mixer and add all the lights from here. And just like that, we'll have a perfect setup of a dynamic sun sky. Now, to be able to change the direction and the height of your sun, 
you can go ahead and press Control L and then hover over with your mouse to be able to move the direction and change whether you want it to be a sunrise, sunset, or a midday setup. So I'm going to set it right here. And what you're going to do is we're going to check on two more options. We have to go to our skylight right there and make sure that we check on real-time capture so that if we were to move over our light, that ambient light coming out of there is actually perfectly synced up with the sun, as we can see right here. The next setting we have to change is to go back into the skylight and then turn off lower hemisphere is solid color. Because let's say you have a reflective object, you want to make sure that you don't have that black color in the bottom. Next up, we want to go ahead and create a point light. And then what we want to do is we want to go ahead and add our character in here. And as you can see right here, our shadows are looking really sharp and very video game. So how do we change that? Well, all you have to do is just increase the source radius and we can see our shadows are actually getting softer. This is because our light source is actually getting bigger in size, which makes the shadows a lot softer. The next up, we have to change our indirect lighting intensity. And as you can see right here, the light is being bounced around a lot better with the indirect intensity much higher. Next up, what we want to do is we want to go into our exponential height fog. We can actually turn on volumetrics. And once we do this, we can actually see a little bit of softness happening right there. So if we were to dial up intensity, we can actually see that there's a little bit of fog happening with the light. We can change the intensity of our light to make this effect even bigger or we can change up the volumetric intensity as we can see right here. Next up we can actually go back into our exponential fog and really play with a lot of these settings to get the perfect type of fog that we need for our scene. 